So good to be back in the house of the Lord. So good to see all your faces this morning. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. I know we've got some wonderful praise reports this morning, and we'll give you a chance to do that. But um, for right now, we're going to stand and sing our verse together and praise the verse. Let's all stand. It's John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And let's all say this together. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth.
Sing this with us now. He is our Father. Come on now.
Oh 
peace that passes all understanding. God, all these things to just infiltrate her life. Give John the strength and the wisdom and knowledge to be the husband he needs to be right now. God, that whole situation is in your hand. Lord, you hold the beginning and the end. God, you have the answer. Doesn't matter where they are right now, you have the answer. God, right now we just pray that you give the strength that's needed, the peace that's needed, the guidance that's needed to get them through where they are right now. This is for only a season. And Lord, during this season, you promise us strength. You promise us help. You promise us guidance. You promise us peace. And Lord, we're just asking right now, God, that you do. And Father, through, through every single one that's under the sound of my voice right now, God, there may be somebody really going through something, God, that they, they just cannot seem to get through. Oh, God, give them peace today. Let them see your greatness. How great you are, Father, let them see it today. Father, this is our prayer, and we accept it. We receive it. God, it's ours, and we're going to take it. Lord, you've opened up your hand this morning, and we're reaching in your hand, and we're taking what's ours. And we thank you today, God. We give you praise right now, and we just ask you to do it right now. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. <laughs> the splendor of a king. that have come out. 
And Lord, we'll praise you. We will worship you because you are our God and you are great. And today, God, we just ask you to move. God, do what needs to be done. Move us out of the way. God, let the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, let it do its work today. And Father, we'll give you praise and we'll be excited as we are now. God, we're so excited about you and what you're doing. And God, today, do it. Cleanse the hearts and cleanse the minds. And Lord, put the minds and hearts at rest today to know that you're in control. And Father, we ask you to do it right now in your precious name. Amen and amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God is good. And God is great. All right, Becky, come on, lead us in some singing. We want you to greet one another in the Lord. Shake somebody's hand now. Let them know it's good to see them in the house of the Lord.
God is good. All the time. Praise the Lord. It is exciting. It is exciting. Yeah, we'll go ahead and shut it down. We're going to turn it back on here in a little while. So we don't have enough time to cool down. Leave that down there, brother. We're going to wait on you for tithes and offerings. And I know Sister Dana is getting ready to give some announcements. But I am, I, I really, I want to say this, okay? I want you to hear me say this. Today's business meeting, after we're done, and, and I'm guilty of this because originally, the whole week, God was dealing with my heart in a different way and, and, and the board and us got together and said, hey, we need to make sure we show everything that we can possibly show so that everybody knows where the money's gone, where the money's at, where things are at. And it, and it got to be more of just the business of the church, which is fine. That's what we need. But all this week, God has been dealing with my heart. And those that aren't here today are going to miss it. I'm just going to be open with you. If you're going to leave, you're going to miss it. All right? God is compelled me to share some things with you today in the business meeting that I did not think he wanted me to share. Okay. So I'm going to share some things with you today. And if you have to leave early, I'm sorry. You're going to miss it. And those that aren't here today, for whatever reason, I'm sorry. You, you need to get to, I don't know if we're going to tape it or not, but it's important that you be here today because there's going to be some things that's going to be shared that, that we all should be aware of and that we should know about. So uh, I had no idea God was going to loose me to say some things. And today he confirmed it in me this morning that these are things I need to talk about. So we will be doing that. And I said all that just to let you know ahead of time. We're going to go ahead and take the offering and we're going to bypass any singing. We're going to go right into the message and we're going to try to have some time set aside that we can uh, not keep you people here too long. So keep that in mind. Bow your heads. We'll pray over the offering. Father, thank you uh, for this time and this uh, opportunity to give back to your kingdom. Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do. And God, right now, we just ask that you bless what comes into the storehouse. God, everything that comes in here, God, we just pray that you use it to multiply your kingdom in every way. God, bless those who can give today and, and multiply them, Father. And bless those who cannot give. Help them. Encourage them. And Father, we'll give you praise in your precious name. Amen.
the 16th. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, happy birthday, Leo. Happy birthday, Leo. I have it to the 7th. Happy birthday, Leo. Our winners of the Newlywed Game, we played the Newlywed Game last Sunday, and our winners was Chris and Laura. So we were all surprised. Uh, they were the second to the youngest, I think, of, of Newlyweds. But, um, all right, our Bible study is tomorrow night. Men's and women's is on. So it starts at 6.30, so um, uh, be sure to, if you are attending that. Where are the men meeting? Papa. Rick and Gloria. Rick and Gloria's house. Right. Rick and Gloria's house. Which tomorrow night's collective defense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you have any questions where that is, uh, see Rick, see Rob, see Tim, um, our pastor, um, and they can let you know. And then uh, there's not going to be any movie night. I know it's in the bulletin, but uh, since we had the snow and it's moved us back some, we're, or the ice, snow, and all that that we had to cancel, we're going to cancel the movie night this Wednesday. And um, uh, so church starts at 7 on Wednesday. And I believe we are back talking about Yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but how many, are, how many have been enjoying the Wednesday night study? I, I'm, I'm honestly saying this is the best study that I've been involved with. I really believe that. And, and again, if you're able to make it on Wednesday nights and you don't because you're what? Lazy. Okay. Guess what? That's not God's fault. Okay. And, and again, I, I throw this out there because Wednesday night has been just awesome. The studies have been awesome. And, and again, if you can make it, please make it. We are on the anointing of God. And, it, and it's very, very uh, in-depth and, and, it, and it's strong. It's, it's strong teaching. And then like Pastor said today, right after church is our business meeting. And then we're going to have a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> For us ladies, um, as some of you know, everybody doesn't know, but uh, Brenda's dad passed away, passed away this week. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we need to uh, discuss getting our, the arrangements together for the food for the family. Um, the showing is going to be at Crown Hill uh, Monday night from 4 to 8. And then, and he, his name is John Ashner. Is that right, Brenda? Asher. Asher. Okay, his name is John Asher. And um, then the funeral is going to be Tuesday at Crown Hill at 11 o'clock. So... Um, we, and then the family's going to be coming back here to eat, so uh, we need to be preparing food for them. So we're going to be having a quick meeting right after the meeting uh, to get that all put together. If by chance you cannot stay for the, the meeting, I know it runs into late, I'm going to put a piece of paper back there. Just sign your name, what you want to bring, just so that we have a, an idea. Um, and then if you even forget to do that, call me. Um, so that we can talk and let you know. Rhonda's going to be here Tuesday um, at 10 o'clock, just so that you know if you have to leave early. We're going to discuss this also in our meeting. But she is going to be here Tuesday at 10 if people want to bring that food then. And then also the Bible study is going to be here tomorrow night, and you can bring food also and drop it off Monday evening. So because I know we have a lot of people that work and are able to do that. But, we will be talking right after the meeting about what we want to bring uh, to do that. And that is all I have. So. Okay, who has the kids? I don't know. Pam does. Pam, okay. We'll dismiss our children's church. <coughs> Sister Pam Fowlfield is teaching them this morning.
We started a series last week, actually the first week of the, the month, but it was a series on how great is your God. Last week we talked about his great love. How many were here last week? Wasn't it awesome to see how great his love is for us and how powerful his love is for us? Today I want to share with you just a few moments and what a day that uh, this message falls on and, and how many know God knows what he's doing? You may think I, this was the message I had for three weeks ago and God kept putting it up, putting it up, putting it up. And now this message today is, is the message that falls on a day that we're going to be sharing a lot of things uh, about this church and this body uh, of work that God has put together. And the title to this uh, message today is A Great God in Hard Times. Look at your neighbor and say, he's a great God even in hard times. You know, we talked about the greatness of God last week. And we talked about how great the God is that we serve. And it is important for each and every one of us to get to a place to where we take inventory. And when I say take inventory, I mean we have to look at our lives sometimes and just take inventory of how great God has been in our lives. Sometimes we as humans, we get caught up in the bad stuff. How I many know you are human, so you are negative naturally? Now, we have very positive people, and I have met people who are positive beyond positive. But still somewhere in there, you fight the battle of being negative. And it's good sometimes as Christians to sit down when we begin to get negative. Any Christians ever get negative? Yep. It's good sometimes to sit down when we're in those positions and start to take inventory over our lives and say, look, this is important to understand how great God has been in my life. And I'm sure everybody sitting under the sound of my voice, you can go through your life and you can see somewhere where God has moved in your direction and done something great in your life. He is greater than great. Repeat that with me. He is greater than great. He's bigger than big. Oh yeah. He's stronger than strength. He's more powerful than power. Now you need to think on that one for a while. He's more powerful than power. There is no, we don't even understand how great our God is. And guess what? Our God is the kind of God who loves to show off. You ever met somebody who loves to show off? Well, I've been called to show off my whole life. Because I like to watch people laugh. See, there's something to me, it does me good when I see someone smiling or when I see someone laughing. So, so yeah, I guess I can be considered a show-off because I like to make people laugh. And I, but you know what? There's been too many times I've showed off and, and, and at my hurting expense, they laughed. Okay? See, God doesn't work that way. God is so great that He loves to show off His greatness. And from the very beginning of time, throughout the day that we stand here today, God has done so many great things to show us He's still there, I'm still around, I'm still great, I'm still more powerful than anything you'll ever face, I'm still the God that you can come to that has all the answers to everything that you go through. That's the God we serve, a God who is so great, He desires to show off and show off His greatness. I shared something with you last week, and we're going to get into the meat of the message, but I shared something with you last week that you need to remember. Don't ever judge God's greatness by what He does for you. See, sometimes we'll do that. We'll say, okay, God has done this, so He's great. But let me tell you something. Even when He's not doing something that you see, He is still great. He may be doing something that you don't see that's even greater than the thing that he let you allowed you to see. So sometimes don't sit down and say, well, God's not really been great in my life because I'm going through this and I'm having this happen and this is going on and I'm not getting through this. God's not really shown his greatness to me because let me tell you something. If you're still hanging on and you're still kicking and you're still breathing and you still have the Holy Spirit speaking to you and convicting you and keeping you going, God has been great. 
We have to realize sometimes that His goodness goes way beyond what we think and how we measure. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. This is one of the most familiar passages. One of my favorites, and I've preached it three or four different times in three or four different ways. But this passage today about Elijah is going to share with us two things. Things to do to keep God great in our lives and things not to do in the times when we need God's greatness. And we're going to find out these things. How many are there? 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to start with verse 1. We're only going to read through 19. I'm reading now the New King James. Here's what it says. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now remember, Elijah had challenged the people, the prophets of Baal. And he had stood out on the mountainside and he called fire down from heaven. Okay, and it consumed the altars. And it made Ahab very upset, especially after he killed all of the prophets. Now listen to this. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let, it, let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and what? Ran. Ran for his life. And went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. Is that right? The prophet of God had just called fire down from heaven, and he prayed that he might die. It says, and said, it is enough. I can't do this anymore, God, is what he's saying. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he laid and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in strength of that for, uh, food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, uh, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in the place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. You ever felt alone? God, it's just me. Nobody at the sanctuary really cares. None of my brothers and sisters really care. They really don't care what I'm going through. I'm here by myself. It's just me. I am alone and left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? 
And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nemus, Nisha, uh, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, uh, of Abel, Lord have mercy, Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill them. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill them. Yet I have reserved, listen to me now, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Let me share something with you, and I'm going to grab something that I know will help you. If you will grab a hold of this right now, it will help you in the position that you're in. I don't know about you, but God is wanting to be great in your life. God wants to do great and mighty miracles, yes, in your life. Look at your neighbor and say, yes, he wants to do it in my life. Yes. See, it's so easy for me to stand up here and proclaim a miracle for your life. It's easy when Sister Becky's standing here and God's speaking through me and saying, it's going to be okay. You tell her that I got, I got her covered. Man, there's something comes over me that I know I have no doubt in my mind that God is going to take care of Becky. Yes, amen. But man, when it comes to me, whew, I don't know, God. I feel alone. I don't know, God. I don't know if you can do this miracle in my life. I don't know, Lord, if you can do what needs to be done in my life. God, I don't, I, I don't know if you can. I, I know you're big and I know you're great, but will you do it for me? See, that's where we are today. We need to grab a hold of this fact. Yes, he can do it for you. Look at your neighbor and say, he can do it for me. God can perform every miracle, everything that needs to be done. The greatest move of God can happen right inside of you. Because that's the God we serve. A great big God who loves to do great things. Now let me share something with you. Some of you are going through it. I could go around this room right now and pick about 16 people and say, this message is for you. Please listen. You ever had God say, will you please listen? Yeah. The other day, I was, I was rambling. I'm good at rambling. See, I'm a wordy person. Even God knows that. Sometimes God will let me ramble, and then he'll stop me and say, will you just shut up and listen? Listen to what I'm about to tell you. How many want the greatness of God moving in your life? Listen to what happened here. Okay, God will be great during hard times if we don't do these things. Do not, look at your neighbor and say, do not do these things. <laughs> you want the greatness of God in your life? Number one, don't run and hide from your troubles. It's okay to go to somebody, your pastor, or some godly counsel. It's okay to go and tell them what your problems are and your troubles are and pray for me, pray with me on this. But do not run from them. Do not do the ostrich religion. If I bury my head in the sand long enough, this thing will go away. If, oh, and I'm getting on the faith preachers nowadays. And, I, and the reason why is because it's right here in the Word of God. Just because I say it ain't there, that don't mean it ain't there. Just because I get up in the morning and say, hey, that, that bill that needs to be paid today, it ain't there. Yes, it is there. 
You hear what I'm saying? Am I preaching against faith? No, I'm not preaching against faith. I'm telling you there's times when something's there and it's there and it ain't going away. There's times there's something there and I wish it would go away and I don't know why it hasn't left and I don't know what it's going to take to get rid of it, but it is there. And there comes a time that our Christian walk and our walk with the Lord, we have to face the things that's in our life and realize it is real, it is there. But one thing is for certain, I will not run from that thing. I will look it straight in the eye and say, wherever you take me, I'll have to go, I guess. Because guess what? I don't care where it leads me or where it takes me. I know one thing for sure. My father's right by my side. See, that's a, that's a place to shout right there. Amen. See, because I'm going to tell you something. Some of you are going through stuff you don't need to go through. You're going through it trying to fix it, and God's saying, you can't fix it. Why do you keep fooling with it? Why do you keep holding on to it? Why do you keep trying to make it work? Why do you keep trying to figure it out? Why do you keep trying to set the path when I'm saying, no, leave it alone. i got it taken care of. Face the fact that it's there and give it to me. Don't run from it. See, there are things in my life I'm starting to face because they're there and there's nothing I can do about it. And guess what? There's th I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if I let my mind run off of that thing, I'm going to have myself in bad shape. But guess what? If you want the greatness of God to perform in your life, you have to look at your situations and realize that they are problems and you have to face them and realize I will not run and I will not hide from them. Elijah decided I'm going to run and hide because Jezebel threatened me. Boy, he thought that was funny. Some of us, we're the same way. You got to remember now, Elijah... Can you imagine what he looked like? I thought about this the other day. I, I imagine, I wanted to really imagine what Elijah looked like. I bet you he was a mess. I bet you he didn't care if you liked what he wore. I bet you he didn't care if you liked what he ate. Elijah was in tune with God and Elijah was at a place in his life where he could stand in front of all the prophets of Baal and all the people and he could look into heaven and he could say, God, I know you've heard my voice before and I have no doubt you're going to do it again. I'm calling fire down from heaven. And now he's running from a woman. I thought, when I read this, I thought, ho, 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 wait a minute. If I was Elijah and I got the word like that from her, I would have walked right up to her and I said, let me tell you something. Who do you think you are? That's how we should do the devil sometimes. Sometimes we need to look the devil in the eye, quit running from our face and let me look, bud. So you may have talked or been really bad, but I'm going to tell you it's behind me because standing right behind me is the great who all things. Because it will not work. But what we do, we run and hide. I gotta find me a cave. <laughs> Jezebel done threatened me. Oh Lord, Jezebel threatened me, so I'm gonna run and hide after I just called fire down from heaven. Figure that out. You know what that tells me? That tells me how human we are. That tells me how human Elijah was. That even the greatest prophet of fire, the prophet of fire, could call it down from heaven, ran when the woman said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so do not run and hide from your problems. Let me tell you what, here's next. And he did a whole lot of this. Don't you whine and complain all the time. Y'all need this, okay? I need it. Quit whining and complaining. Look at your neighbor and say, quit whining and complaining. Now some of you talking to your wife or your husband, they're going to get mad at you now. Do you know what 
we do, Elijah went to God and he said, <laughs> Oh, Lord. Just kill me, God. I've done all these great things. I gave you everything. And look what you're doing to me. We can spend all of our time whining and complaining about where we are and what's happening. And, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not discouraging you for going and, and getting counsel and help, getting help where you are today. But what I am warning you about is if you want the greatness of God to move in your life, you've got to get past the whining and complaining and see it as God getting ready to do something great. See, I've told myself, it doesn't matter how bad things get. It doesn't matter how I feel. I'm going to do my best to not let it come out of my mouth. The only time I'm going to let it come out of my mouth is if I'm sharing it with someone to pray with me or if I'm sharing it with somebody that I know I can go to that can help me. Because guess what? Everything else is just my selfish body crying out. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me when I'm going through See, some of you don't like this preaching. I can't help it. You're going to have to take it up with God. Because Elijah did the same thing. He said, God, you might as well kill me. I've done everything. I've worked for you. I, I'm just, oh, and, and we all know what that creates, and, and we can go into that, but you all know that whining and complaining all the time. Guess what it does? It, it, it gets you set up for your own little pity party. Guess who shows up? Nobody, just you. You can make it all pretty. You can, you can put signs out in front of your house. Uh, there's a pity party here today. Nobody's coming. Elijah did that. Don't whine and complain. Number three, don't give up. Look at your neighbor and say, don't give up. Don't give up. If you give up, you're saying to God, you're not big enough. If you give up, you're saying to God, you're not as big as my problem I'm going through. If you give up, you're saying to God, you're not great enough to take care of my needs. So I guess I'll quit and do it on my own. See, you may not realize that, but when you give up on God, that's what you're doing. You're saying, God, you're not big enough. I'll take care of it. How many know that's some dangerous ground right there? That's dangerous ground. Don't give up. Last thing before we go into what you need to be doing. Last thing, don't ever forget what God has done for you. You know what? Elijah should have sat down for a few moments and took inventory like we talked about. He should have sat down and said, look, God, you were here when the woman needed to be touched. You were here. Uh, I, I had it printed out and, and I didn't bring it, but, but he, he had about uh, somewhere about around seven miracles that Elijah was involved with that were great miracles that were just off the chart. He could have sat down and begin to go through those miracles and actually sat there and say, you know what, sometimes we talk ourselves into by doing this, what we're talking about now, not forgetting what God has done for us. Sometimes sitting down and just thinking of all the goodness and all the greatness and all the good things that God has done for us, it'll pull us right up out of that place we're at. And Elijah could have went in and could have said, look, here's what God has done for me. I have to do this sometimes. I'll sit down and I'll say, look, I may not like where I'm at now. It may be difficult where I'm at now. And I may not have an answer where I am right now. But let me tell you something. I took an inventory and God has been with me all these days. Do not forget how good God has been to you. Some of you wouldn't be here today. If God had not done something for you. Some of you under the sound of my voice would be somewhere probably waking up with a serious headache this morning. Instead of worshiping the great and mighty God, you'd be worshiping the porcelain God. Don't ever forget 
what God has done for you. Three things now, then we're going to close. God will be great during hard times if you will do these things. These three things. Number one, truthfully face your situation. See, God cannot be great if you're going to excuse away where you are. God cannot be great if you do not explain to yourself what you're going through, what is happening. God cannot be great unless you say, hey, look, this is a huge problem, God, and truthfully, I cannot deal with it. How many know there are things in our lives we cannot deal with? And truthfully looking at that and saying, I cannot fix this. It cannot be fixed. Truthfully looking at it opens the door for God to step in and say, okay, now I can do my work. Now I can do what needs to be done. The second thing to think about and make sure you're going to do if you want the greatness of God to move in your life is commit yourself to draw close to him. See, here's where we miss it. And this morning we were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school. Sometimes it's just plain old flat out. If you want the greatness of God to move in your life, you've got to move with him. You've got to move towards him. You've got to get close to him. See, we think God's a big Santa Claus sometimes. And he's just going to come down and he's going to take care of it. But guess what? Sometimes God's sitting on the throne and saying, I want to take care of that, but you need to get close to me. There's some things you need to learn in this so that you can draw close to me. If you want the greatness of God to move in your life, you have to draw close to him. Elijah was close to God. Elijah got to the place to where God would speak to him. Elijah got to the place where he could stand on the mountainside and God would speak to him in a mighty way. If you want the greatness of God in your life, get close to Him. The last thing I want to leave with you. This is not easy. But if you want the greatness of God in your life, you've got to trust Him all the way and keep moving forward. See, it's so important to understand how important it is to keep plugging away. To keep putting one foot in front of the other. To keep stepping out and saying, you know, I don't feel like this today, but I know this is a thing I need to do. I need to move towards God. Now, see, that can happen in a whole lot of ways. That can happen in your reading of the Word. That can happen in your church attendance. That can happen in your fellowship attendance. That can happen in so many ways. But you have to grab a hold of the fact that you have to trust God and you have to keep moving toward Him. Somebody asked me the other day. They said, Pastor, how do you know? How do you know when you finally reach the end of your road? And my answer was simple. I said, you know what? I don't think we know, we'll ever know the end of our road. Because guess what? Close to the end of everyone's road, guess who's standing there? God. He stops us, comes through for us every time when we think it's the end. I've said it before, it's not just an end. Or it's not, a bend, it's not a, an end, it's a bend in the road. Sometimes we think this is it, it's over, there's nothing else left there. And God said, no, I'm just taking you somewhere else. So trusting Him completely all the way, moving toward Him. See, this is so important. People move away from Him. When trouble comes, they hide. When trouble happens, they go another direction. When trouble happens, they begin to hide and pull themselves away from God. And all the while, we need to be moving toward Him in every way. Let's bow our heads. Sister Ray, come on up. I want to share something with you. Bow your heads and close your eyes. God is so great. But He will not force Himself on you. He will not force the Holy Spirit to do things in your life that you won't allow Him to do. And I truly believe that a lot of us go through things that we don't need to go through because 
Number one, we, we don't allow God to have everything. If we want the greatness of God to be what it is in our lives, we got to let it be God. And today I know, I have no doubt, God's already put it in my spirit. There are so many people in this place today that need a great move of God in their life. And you know what? I'm going to say this. It, it, you may not need a great move in your life, but you know somebody that your heart is broken for that you know they need a great move. And I believe the faster we get to that place, to where we let God have that, God begins to show His greatness. He's not going to take something out of your hand that you won't let Him have. He wants you to give it to Him. And today, we're going to close in this prayer. I want to do it this way. If you are here under the sound of my voice and you have something in your life or something for someone else's life that you've been, you're just struggling with it and, and, and you almost feel like it's something that you just can't let go of all the way, I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come forward. Don't hesitate. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Come forward. shared something we can spread out along the front here if we can get everybody up here I shared something with the Sunday school class this morning that, that the Sunday school class is just awesome I mean I, I stand in there sometimes just blown away by, by what's being taught and, and what's coming out but this morning God, I shared something with them that God has been dealing with me about in my life my personal life and that is that the more I become dependent on God, the more I get out of the way and God does his good stuff. Some of you, under the sound of my voice, you're not quite dependent on God all the way on it. You're still holding on to it. You're still depending on you to do something. And God's saying, don't do that. Let go of it. Don't depend on yourself to quit carrying on, to quit sinning, to quit doing these things. Don't depend on yourself to do that because guess what you're going to do? You're going to fail. But what God is saying is, hey, don't worry about the sins. Don't worry about the things that's going on. Give them to me. Just keep trusting me. Keep moving toward me. And before you know it, I'm going to move in your life and you're going to see something great. And I believe that with all my heart. So as we pray, I want you to just, we're going to pray that you're able to begin to release that thing to God. Pray with me. Come on now. Father, right now, thank you for your word. Oh, God, thank you for your word. Lord, you see everyone that's standing here right now. God, you know before we ask. The Bible says you know before we even pray what we need. God, you know every heart that's standing here today. You know every situation that's standing here today. God, you know every need that's standing here in front of us today. But God, we come to you because your scripture tells us to come to you and ask you. God, we come right now and we ask you. Father, hear our prayer today. Lord, take each and every one of these that stand here today. God, begin to help them to release their situation to you. Fully, completely. God, help them to let it go to the point to where they're free from it. They have a peace about it. They don't need it back because they know it's in your hands. God, do it today, we pray. Lord, do something that man cannot do. Do something down and deep inside the soul today. That 
sense that passes all understanding, that, that speaks to us, and we don't even know how it happened. We just know it happened. God, do it today. Help them release that thing to you, that it's in your hands. And God, when the devil reminds them that it's still there, Lord, you give them the strength and the stamina to say it's still there, but God has it in his hand now. Give them that strength, that wisdom, that knowledge. Father, we'll give you praise for answering our prayer. We thank you so much today, God, in your precious name. Amen and amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. I'm going to ask our council to come forward. As we begin this meeting, I want to I want to lay some things out for you. Bye, Terry. Love you, sweetheart. First, I want to say that these men that are in front of you today. God has selected. Truly has. They have your best interest in mind in everything that we do. And I know some of you probably think, well, you know, pastor does this, but let me tell you something. These guys have a lot to say when we're making decisions. These guys have things to say that even surprise me at times. Okay? And when I say that, it's not because I don't think they have the ability and everything. It's that I, I wasn't thinking that way. And they come, they come to the table with stuff that I know God has shown them. And today as we go through this, we, uh, we want it to be somewhat loose. We don't want it to be so formal that it's, uh, that it's something that, uh, you know, we, everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's what Let me tell you something. They're going to show you what you have done. Okay? I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Everything you see today is what you have done. And it's what God has done through you that is awesome. We're going to show you some things. And I'm going to go ahead and put... Whoop, I, I went too far. Sorry. We're going to show you some things. First, introduction to prayer, which I'm doing now. Then we're going to have a financial overview. We're going to have a year in report. We're going to have a calendar year of 2000. Uh, 10 2011 budget snapshot we're going to have property purchase status uh, we're going to let you know where we are with that today and we're going to have looking forward in 2011 there's some things I'm going to share with you that God has shown me are you ready? Amen. let's bow our heads close our eyes Father thank you for this time thank you Lord for what you've done thank you God that you have moved in our direction Thank you, Father, that you've had your hand on this ministry, this church. And today, Father, we'll be sharing, we'll be sharing your goodness today. And Father, we just ask that you bless each and every one that's involved. Lord, help him. God, help understanding. Make sure that understanding is there. And God, just let us be free to understand what has happened business-wise in this church and what you're doing in this ministry. And God, we'll give you praise and glory in your precious name. Amen. We're going to ask Brian to come. Brian, are you, are you down? Do you need a microphone? No, I'm not good. Okay, we're going to let you go here for a minute. I'm going to cover the areas between the financial overview and the property purchase status. And I think you're going to be amazed by some things. I know I was when I crunched down through some of the numbers. First thing was the financial overview. What's really uh, neat to see here is to take a look at... Uh, <coughs> God's obedience as a church and things like this weekly offering. The income, 
through the hardest of times and through some of the socioeconomic things that we uh, had to go through as, as uh, a local group, as a state and a nation. And as such, you always have some of your expenses go up because we have more ministries. We attempt to do more things that God leads the pastor and lead us to do more things to reach out. There's your snapshot, and here's your, your 2010 right there. Your year-end report, that was your budget. Here's your income. It's just uh, divided by four there. Here's the ending balance of the general fund and the fundraising balance as of 31 December. <coughs> Very simple. Here's your budget snapshots. And this is kind of critical. You'll see where we were at here. We go back one. You see the 5337. Here's the numbers that comprise that. Most everybody, I think, can see the darker here in, in, in the red. These were where some adjustments were made. And you see we have a net increase to the budget of 476. Some key areas here. Insurance does as insurance is wanting to do. It went up a little bit. We had to increase there. We all know gas prices are good, and quite honestly, that's a modest increase there for all the traveling and all the things that the pastor does. And uh, with the use of that, the council felt we would increase the pastor a lot. And we synced us some of the monthly functions numbers because we realized we were doing more special events and entry. We really felt we needed to concentrate in a budget no. and that type of thing. So you'll see an increase there. The bottom line no. from 2010 to 2011, $476. The good news is, if you take a look at the average monthly income, what we propose the budget to be, we're still well under that. Giving hearts, obedience, everything else, we're still well under that and able to take care of that for you. Here's your property purchase stamps. It starts one of the many miracles here at the church. That's your end state, $60,000. From about November of 09 to end of December, there's your number. That's how close the goal is. That's what's left. Pastor, if I believe it, I don't want to steal your thunder. You have been told, or it is on your heart from God that uh, any of our this year, possibly, this, this will not be. At least, uh, and I'm not going to say any more about it, so the pastor has more to say about this. Uh, and again, I had said something that really means my heart. We, we want to see something. You said we were going to have mental health. I just want to make sure we're good, care, time, and all these personal things. And I just want to make sure we're good, care, time, and all these things. And this is going to come for me. Because some of this is... Things that I never thought that I would share with you. But let me ask the let me ask a question. How many don't raise your hand? Okay, I'm just making I'm giving you that food for thought. How many of you when Pastor came, I think it was in October of 2009, Pastor came and said God spoke to him and we're gonna go after this property behind us. Some of you may remember, some of you may not. And God told me that there was $25,000 immediately available. Some of you may remember that, some of you may not. I know this much. When God told me that, I was rebuking every kind of evil spirit and everything in the whole I said, Lord, I know our congregation. That ain't there. And then it got worse when God said, no, not only is it there, you're going to have to tell them it's there. <laughs> See, you, here's, you know, if you know me very well, I've worked my entire life. I've worked ever since I was 16 years old. I've worked hard. I've, I've, made, I've made it my... I know what you go through. 
I'm not some minister that uh, has a, a $500,000 a year salary on his church and, and sits back and just keeps talking about money. I know exactly where you are. And when God spoke to me and said, you tell them. Heck, at the time God spoke that into me, some of you started losing your jobs. And God said, you be bold and you tell them. There is $25,000 today, right now, in this congregation. How many, how many remember the story? Three weeks later, what did we have? $30,000. In this church, this congregation. Now, how many believed when pastor came along and said, hey, God said it would be paid off by the end of March? Some of you done went home and wrote it off. Said, Pastor, done went lost his mind. He's nuts. He's went over to the deep end. And when you look at this today, we're still 12, 13,000, somewhere in there. We're still behind. We're off the mark about 12 or 13,000 dollars. If you knew what this council knew, you would be shouting, your head would be hitting the ceiling right now. Because I'm only going to say this it will be paid off Amen. by the end of March. I was, I'm telling you, it's proven fact, it's done, it's over with, it's happening, God's doing it. As we're sitting here today, things are in motion for it to happen, and it will be done just like God said. Amen. I have pastor friends that I share these things with, and each one of them look at me and say, I some, you better you better grab a hold of what you got right now because God is truly moving in your direction. You gotta remember something. You all, this is not about what Pastor has done. It's not about what this council has done. It's about what you all have done. You've minded God, you've listened to God, and over the past year, you have performed above anything you could even imagine because you've allowed God to move in your life. Now, I'm going to hit this next slide, really. We will own the property outright. I'm just telling you now, by the end of next month, it'll be ours. Are you ready for that? Amen. You going to be excited about that when that happens? Does that mean our work is over? No. No. That's why we put fundraisers up here. That's why we, now we've got to continue this thing. We've got to continue to keep plugging to where God is taking us. Spiritual growth is so important. And, and us, this council up here right now, there are times when we sit in meetings and we think about this. We think we cannot just focus on the physical. We have to grow spiritually. We are no good to this community just because we have a pretty building out there. We are no good to this area just because we sound good and because we got something special being built. Where we are accomplishing things is when we spiritually can reach the needs of this community. Where you can be called upon to go speak to someone and help someone get through where they are. Spiritual growth is so important. So don't forget that. Now I'm going to lay this on you. I'm going to go back seven years. How many have been with us seven years? Okay, I knew there wouldn't be, I knew it would only be maybe 25%, maybe 30%. That's why God, I believe God wanted me to go this direction. I'm going to go back seven years ago. See, when we first started this church, Dean and I made up our mind it was going to, the only money it was going to cost was ours. And that was our commitment to God. That God, if it takes our home, if it takes our cars, if it takes everything we have, you've called us to do this. We will, we will invest everything that we can into your ministry. Some of you were here when we started. Some of you weren't. And I'll be honest with you. When we started, God done some great things. But guess what? There were things that God didn't provide. So Dina and I got together and said... We'll provide it. 
So time went on through this thing. And, and, and about seven years ago, God spoke and said, you know what? I can't bless the church anymore because they're not blessing you. And I toiled with that. I fought with that. And I said, God, we had a deal. God, I have a job. And, I, and Lord, I don't, I don't need extra money. That sounded silly, but God knew what I meant. How many of you need any extra money? Okay. But I remember saying, God, Lord, not now. The church, I don't know if the church is ready for this. And he said, oh, well, this is your church? That's, that's a silly us. And I said, no, God, this is your church. He said, it's time for them to go on a program. To start to reach out to the leadership. And I'll tell you exactly what that first piece was. The very first thing they gave us was $400 a month. Woo! Thank God. You may think I'm making a lot of that noise. I'm talking about a church that was in its infancy just about. Felt uncomfortable? Yeah, I felt uncomfortable. I said, if you hold on to God, let me do it the way I need to do it, then bless it. And I need to do it a little more. And I want to see it. And I want to share something to you that's very personal. A few years ago, Dino's her and I, this was a special time for her. We were eating dinner, and I could tell it was a cracker burger. We were eating dinner, and at the same time, we looked at each other, and you had no other. We'd been married 